Institute, Greg Bear. Thanks, everybody. Uh, welcome to the fun night where we don't talk about banking and talk about anything but uh, in our sort of Hamilton tradition. Um, there'll be no singing and dancing tonight, but I think you'll find it every bit as uh, entertaining. Also, I just want to thank uh, my former boss and current partner, Jim Aramanda, and the Clearinghouse for agreeing to do this with us. I was saying to Jim, we're going to have to think about in the future, it's going to be tougher because you know, there'll be a Fed Now conference. Um, although the good news is that won't be for five to 10 years. It'll cost more and it won't really work well. And also, but you'll have to choose which one to go to because they will not be interoperable. Sorry, I, I do that for, for free for you, the Clearinghouse. Uh, Oh, God, that was so much fun. Um, so now on to our regularly scheduled programming. Um, it is an honor to introduce to you Ryan Crocker, who is one of the great diplomats in American history. He has served nobly under three different presidents. He is a recipient of the Presidential Medal of Freedom. In July 2012, he was named an honorary Marine, interestingly becoming the 75th civilian so honored since 1775. Diplomat is actually a bit misleading as it applies to Ambassador Crocker, as it traditionally implies the wearing of formal wear and attendance at cocktail parties. Ryan Crocker has spent his career at the, in the most dangerous places in the world at the most dangerous times. He decided shortly after joining the Foreign Service in 1971 to begin what would become years of Persian language studies. This set him up on an extraordinary career path. Early in his career, he served in Iran, Qatar, he taught me the pronunciation, Iraq, and Egypt. He became chief of the political section of the American Embassy in Beirut, and in 1983 survived the embassy bombing that killed 63 of his colleagues. He subsequently served as ambassador to Lebanon, and then Kuwait and Syria. In the immediate aftermath of 9-11, Ambassador Crocker traveled to Geneva, where he worked with Iranian representatives in a joint effort to capture Al-Qaeda operatives and fight the Taliban in Afghanistan. In, July, in January 2002, he was appointed Chargé d'Affaires at the Embassy of Afghanistan um, and was then later in 2004 confirmed as Ambassador to Pakistan. Between those postings, he's a busy man, he served as, in Baghdad as the first Director of Governance of the, of the Coalition Provisional Authority. He subsequently served as our Ambassador to both Iraq and Afghaz in Afghanistan. Ambassador Crocker retired from the Foreign Service in April 2009 after a 37-year career. Respect for his work is profoundly bipartisan. In September 2004, President Bush conferred on him the rank of career ambassador, the highest rank in the Foreign Service. In May 2009, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton announced the establishment of the Ryan Crocker Award for Outstanding Achievement in Expeditionary Dip Diplomacy. And in 2011, he was recalled to active duty by President Obama to reopen the U.S. Embassy in Afghanistan. Since his most recent retirement, Ambassador Crocker has taught at various institutions, including the University of Virginia and Yale. He has received more honorary degrees than I could possibly mention in the time we have left. Among them, though, are the National Clandestine Services Donovan Award in 2009 and the Director of Central Intelligence Director's Award in 2012. Currently, he is ambassador in residence at Princeton University um, and is on leave as dean and executive professor at the George, w. George Bush School of Government and Public Affairs at Texas A&M University. It is my profound pleasure to introduce him to you and then eventually to join him in conversation. Thank you, uh, Greg, for that uh, generous introduction. I, I could be introduced in a number of ways, depending on how you want to look at my uh, career. Um, I, I like that. Uh, another way would be to sort of look, uh, imagine a photograph of every major setback to America's national security interests in the Middle East since, say, 1979. Uh, if, there if there were such pictures, I would be in every single one of them. You know, kind of first row, second from the right. Uh, uh, 
Uh, well, I always try and start with something to get a little bit of a laugh. You've now had the laugh for the evening, because uh, uh, it is kind of hard to be entertaining about, uh, about the Middle East. And speaking of which, could we throw that? Uh, uh, there it is, yeah. Um, just, uh, just for your reference there, I'm sure you all know which country's next to which, but as a little refresher and to get you prepared for the map quiz that will come at the end. Um, so what I'd like to do is just kind of set the stage broadly for you, and then we'll, um, uh, Greg and I will have a, a conversation, and then you will get to throw your slings and arrows uh, uh, at me. Um, so what is the Middle East? You, uh, you see right away when you ask that question why we get into trouble. Um, in the uh, US administration, there is no common definition of the Middle East. Um, Central Command defines it one way, State Department defines it another way, the Office of the Secretary of Defense yet a third way, so we can't even agree on what it is. Um, this is my version, um, uh, because these are the places of where I served. I had uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan, I couldn't get that neat orange uh, shading in for Pakistan, uh, because I was ambassador to both of them. And uh, since all I knew was the Middle East, I Middle Easternized those two countries to my satisfaction, and that's what we're looking at now. Uh, so as you look at that whole area, um, there is one element that every one of those countries um, has in common. Turkey's on the map not because it's part of the Middle East, but because it used to own the Middle East uh, uh, until uh, the end of World War I. Uh, so, can you guess what characteristic that might be? Uh, here's a hint. Here's a set of hints. Um, it's not language. It's not religion. It's not ethnicity. Uh, it is definitely not oil. Uh, just ask the Jordanians. Um, <clears throat> what it is, is that every one of those countries again, minus Turkey, um, has been occupied by one or more Western powers. Um, uh, okay, well, you blew that one. Uh, <laughs> so here's another one. What is the significance of the year 1798 in the context of the Middle East? Yes. Yes, that is most excellent. Yeah, in 1798, um, Napoleon invaded Egypt. Um, he had to fill in some time between major European agreement, uh, engagements, and uh, there was Egypt. Uh, the French weren't there long, um, but that is the year I consider the advent of uh, the modern historical period in the region. Uh, uh, because those occupations started uh, in earnest after that, where, you know, going west to east, Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, the French. Uh, as a young child, I was in Morocco with my Air Force father when it was still French Morocco. Um, uh, Libya. Uh, occupied by the Italians, and boy, choking back that Italian joke is hard, but um, um, Egypt, the British, Sudan, the British, um, Jordan and Palestine, the British, Syria and Lebanon, the French, the center of Saudi Arabia, uh, because it was only sand at the time, the oil came later, that was not occupied but not occupied by anybody, including those who became known later as, uh, as the Saudis. Uh, the, uh, the Gulf states and the uh, Arabian Sea states, uh, uh, Yemen, Oman, uh, UAE, Bahrain, Kuwait, all in the, uh, uh, the British area. Uh, Iran, not formally occupied, uh, but virtually by the British, 
really did colonize it when um, Winston Churchill made the historic move before World War I to shift the, uh, <clears throat> the British Navy from, uh, from coal to oil. Uh, uh, there, there was an, he was first Lord of the Admiralty at the time and uh, did receive a delegation of senior admirals uh, who complained to him about this, um, um, uh, this outrage against naval traditions and he famously responded, do not speak to me of naval traditions. There are only three, rum, sodomy, and the lash. <laughs> uh, the Navy got their own back on him. Uh, it was that same Winston Churchill who was the architect of the Gallipoli campaign, uh, which incidentally led to the creation of modern Turkey. Uh, the, the division commander defending Gallipoli was um, uh, a two-star Ottoman general named Mustafa Kemal, who after the war adopted the surname Ataturk and uh, built the Turkey that uh, President Erdogan is now taking apart. Uh, <clears throat> so why is any of this um, of significance? Because it, it conditioned <clears throat> Middle Easterners in a particular way to um, to understand that they could not stand against the modern armies of the West. Let them come. Uh, they're going to come anyway. Put up enough of a resistance uh, uh, so that you don't have to be completely ashamed. Hunker down. Uh, and then after they're fat and happy and getting pretty dumb, then you start the fight. Uh, and that has been a characteristic of engagements in the region. Again, French, British, Russians, Americans, uh, we've all experienced that. Not that we learn from it, but we, um, we experience it. Uh, so that's kind of the, the uh, political cultural overview. Uh, I'm going to talk just a little bit about history in another context. Uh, this is 2019. It's been the 100th anniversary cycle <clears throat> of a lot of events uh, related to the First World War. Uh, 1919, 100 years ago, was when the Versailles Treaty was concluded. Uh, the United States was a player in Versailles for the first time outside of our borders, uh, but not much of a player. Uh, Woodrow Wilson was there. Um, he had some ideas about uh, democracy and his famous 14 points as an uh, international blueprint, but the, uh, the British and the French uh, were not interested in having the Americans horning into their area. And indeed, in 1916, in the middle of the war, they had uh, concluded an agreement between them, uh, the Sykes-Picot Agreement, secret at the time, uh, in which the Middle East was uh, basically divided into French and British zones of influence. Um, what um, Wilson had in mind, and he actually dispatched a, uh, a commission to do the research, uh, was something different than colonial occupation. Uh, the King Crane Commission uh, went out to the area, did the unthinkable and unheard of, uh, actually interviewing Middle Easterners and asking them what kind of post-Ottoman order they wanted in their lands. Uh, well, everyone obviously said independence. Um, that was not on the cards. The second choice was uh, a unitary mandate uh, under the United States. Um, the Brits were a very distant third, and the French didn't move the needle. They'd already had that experience. Um, none of that happened, of course. Um, uh, and it was a time when parts of the Middle East, like uh, present-day Israel and the Palestinian territories, became, as it were, the thrice-promised land um, uh, for um, <clears throat> 1916. Palestine and present-day Israel would have been under the British mandate, and indeed, indeed they were. Um, <clears throat> 1917, you had the Balfour Declaration out of London. Uh, His Majesty's government would look with favor on the establishment of a Jewish homeland in Palestine. Uh, uh, and then there was the McMahon 
uh, Hussein correspondence, the Emir of Mecca, that Hussein, uh, in which uh, the Emir was given to believe that um, they, the Arabs, would be in a position to uh, run affairs in the Levant, including the Palestinian uh, area. Uh, and I, I just relate all this to, to just explain this complex interaction between the West and the, uh, the Arab East. Um, so what happened? Um, this was empire on the cheap. Uh, the French and the British were in no way interested in doing anything for the benefit of Middle Eastern people. They wanted to make some money and they wanted to spend as little as possible. Um, they certainly weren't interested in preparing the peoples of those lands for self-governance. Um, uh, <clears throat> and that is important because as we look at the Middle East today, um, what we see, if you have to distill the problems of the Middle East to a single term, that, that term would be governance, uh, or the lack thereof. Um, Going through that whole region today, we have only one fully-fledged democracy, uh, and that would be Israel, and the Israeli form of democracy has uh, gotten right to the edge of the cliff now. Uh, Lebanon partial, Iran partial, the others not much at all. Uh, so I, I call this the succession of isms. Um, uh, in, after World War I, you had uh, colonialism slash imperialism. Um, you had monarchism in places like uh, uh, Iraq and Egypt, Jordan. Um, then you had um, uh, authoritarianism, militarism, uh, when monarchies were knocked off uh, and generals uh, took command. You had communism in South Yemen. Uh, you had uh, Arab socialism, Baathism in Iraq and Syria, um, republicanism in Yemen. Um, uh, they all had one thing in common. They all failed to provide good governance to the people they were supposed to be ruling. Um, uh, <clears throat> now we have Islamism in places like um, uh, Iran and, of course, Islamic State. And uh, <clears throat> they'll be back, folks. Um, you heard it here first. They've, they've never really gone away. They will be back. Uh, the good news is Islamism, too, has really failed as, uh, again, a framework for good governance. Uh, and uh, that's the good news. The bad news is there's going to be another ism flopping around out there uh, that we may not see yet, but uh, will manifest itself at some point. And my guess is without a, an infrastructure of institutions, uh, they too will fail. So at this time of not just governments overthrown, but st states completely failed, uh, that trend is not likely to reverse anytime soon. Uh, and then comes the question, what do we do about it? And I'll, I'll just conclude with that. Uh, <clears throat> the end of World War II was very different than the end of World War I. Um, we got shoved off the stage in World War I. World War II, we were center stage. Um, uh, not just in the Middle East, but globally. It was a U.S. Uh, conceived international order. The United Nations, born in San Francisco, the, um, uh, as all you would know very well, the post-war financial system, Bretton Woods, that moved uh, the world from the gold standard to the dollar standard. Uh, we led, and we led for decades. Uh, that started to change under President Obama. Um, talked about our so-called allies in Egypt and Saudi Arabia, started to back us out a bit, pulled us out of Iraq, um, almost pulled us out of Afghanistan. President Trump has um, taken that uh, a whole lot farther in American retrenchment. So that, that is the question I would leave you with. We clearly are moving into a post-US ascendant world and region with what consequences. Um, and for any of you who um, need something else to keep you awake at night, uh, we are defaulting basically to a, a balance of power system, uh, more or less. 
Well, it was the balance of power system, more or less, that brought you two world wars, um, World War I and World War II. Uh, so again, as you uh, uh, kind of look for the punchline, just bear that in mind. Um, uh, uh, the Middle East is a gift that keeps on giving. What uh, happens in the Middle East most definitely does not stay in the Middle East. Um, and uh, you will not see economic growth or much of anything good until that critical question of governance has a better answer than it does today. <clears throat> <clears throat> I neglected to mention, and I hope they'll put it up on the board, um, if you want to submit questions, uh, you can download an app, which should be appearing, and then they will come up here. Although I've got a lot of questions, but I'll try to make room for some of yours. Um, so thanks. That was as good a framing as I could possibly have hoped for. Um, so let's move quickly to present events, and then I'm going to ask you maybe some thematic questions. Um, so very current. Uh, today, uh, Secretary of State Pompeo announced that um, Israeli settlements in the West Bank are no longer inconsistent with international law. I think that actually follows on a less noticed announcement in March that was very similar with regard to the Golan Heights. Um, it seems clearly to be moving at least this administration, and that'll be my question, away from a potential two-state solution to the Israeli-Palestinian question. Um, is that a fair observation? And is, is that just a Trump administration view, or have all the Arab states sort of cooled on the notion of two states? Uh, and it is a central question. We, we don't hear uh, that much about the Palestinian-Israeli dispute, uh, uh, but it is still very much there and very unresolved. This administration has taken a series of steps. Uh, uh, as you say, the, uh, a similar announcement uh, on the Golan Heights, uh, moving our embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, uh, something that all modern previous presidents have promised but none delivered. Uh, closing the PLOs, or the Palestinian Authority's offices, diplomatic offices in the U.S. It is all signaling that um, the future is now. Um, uh, it isn't going to change, and it certainly isn't going to be changed by us. Um, I can't help but noting that it probably was time to maybe help Bibi a little bit in his effort to uh, put together a government, which has not succeeded thus far. Uh, uh, this is something for which we will pay, probably not now, but later. Uh, you'll find sometimes in the Middle East there's a vast uh, expanse of time between flash and bang. Uh, I think there is a bang uh, that is, is going to happen out there uh, in terms of a, an eruption of violence. Uh, uh, not now, but somewhere down the line. Perhaps when the uh, old guard finally gives way, Mahmoud Abbas is, is in his mid-80s right now, the uh, president of the PA. Um, uh, what we are doing is, for the Palestinians, really foreclosing hope. Um, and uh, in all too many instances, when that happens in the Middle East, or indeed anywhere, um, uh, younger people feel there is no other option except violence. And I think we will see that at some point. What I think we will not see is a, any kind of definitive or permanent settlement of that core uh, dispute uh, between um, uh, Palestinians and Israelis. So I mean, previously, sort of relatedly, I mean, previously it seemed that there was a lot of pressure for a two-state solution, again, from the other, other Arab states. But now I don't know if it's that they really never cared and were just doing it for tactical reasons or that they now have bigger problems of their own. But do you get that impression as well, that that sort of slipped off the agenda for the other major states? Uh, it has. Uh, the uh, two-state solution as an Arab um, policy initiative goes all the way back to 2002, the, the, the Fahad initiative out of Saudi Arabia, um, <clears throat> embraced by the Bush administration in 2004. Uh, all of our efforts uh, since that time have been directed toward a two-state solution. Obviously, uh, we did not succeed in that. But if you take it off the table, which we seem to be actively doing, uh, what's left? Uh, you know, n no good options. And by the way, in the Middle East, generally, 
you don't have the choice between good options and bad options. You've got bad options and worse options. Uh, so a two-state solution as implemented or not implemented um, uh, is better than no solution. Uh, a one-state solution that leaves the Israelis in permanent occupation of Palestinian territories um, quiet now, it, it will not stay quiet. Permanent occupations uh, never do. Uh, but it is worth noting um, more damage has been done to the Palestinians and the Palestinian cause, in my view, by Arabs and Arab states who will use it as a pawn uh, than by the Israelis. And the Palestinians are also really great at self-inflicted wounds. Um, uh, you know, it's um, Arabs have used the Palestine issue as a distraction. Folks, look here at this bright, shiny bauble that we'll call uh, Palestine, and while you're riveted on that, we're going to uh, steal your money, deprive your kids of education, and ensure you have no real economic uh, opportunities because we're going to have an emergency law uh, that will stay in place until there is an independent Palestine. If the Israelis ever show any sign of weakening on that, we'll step in to be sure there isn't. What's well, very interesting in there? By the way, I should note that I offered to show him the questions, but we both decided it'd be more fun if I didn't just <laughs> do this a lot. So. Um, but that sort of gets me to Jordan, which seems to be quiescent, um, and I believe is 70% Palestinian, you could say, is the Palestinian state, and yet appears to be in relative peace with Israel. Um, what is the story with Jordan now? Well, Jordan is one of those improbable countries um, that no one really planned to create. It just sort of happened um, uh, in the British Mandate problem, uh, pre uh, period. Uh, it has always kind of teetered on the edge of disaster. Um, in 1958, uh, after the revolution in Iraq, uh, Jordan thought it was going to be next. Uh, the Brits deployed paratroops into Jordan uh, to uh, prevent that eventuality. Um, uh, <coughs> and again, they, they have teetered there really ever since. Um, uh, Jordan was one of the only countries, along with Yemen, who stood against us in the first Gulf War. Um, they did so because they were worried that that Palestinian majority, um, many of whom are uh, Jordanian passport holders called West Bankers versus East Bankers, the traditional Jordanian families, uh, they had no choice in the King's view. They, they could not take on the PLO uh, because they'd done that once before in 1970. Um, the PLO took Jordan on. Uh, it's gone down in history as Black September. That was the appellation that mm -hmm. the Palestinians attached to it. Um, uh, the PLO almost took over the state at that point. Um, so that's where they balance. They now have a huge Syrian refugee population that is inherently destabilizing, one would think. But what it's done uh, has at least temporarily pushed East Bankers and West Bankers together um, against a perceived political and economic threat of a massive uh, refugee population that the country can't sustain. So uh, uh, Jordan, it's, it's one of these unintended consequences. Uh, uh, the horrors of the Syrian civil war have actually benefited um, at least Jordan for the time being. That's fascinating. So speaking of, well, why don't we move on to Syria then? Um, there's no shortage of countries to talk about. Um, so, I mean, what should we, th I mean, is Syria still really a nation state or is it just sort of a battleground for proxy wars? I just saw some statistics that m more Russians have been killed by Americans in Syria in the last year than any time else in history, um, which is fascinating. Um, and that's one of many proxies. So what is Syria now? Still in the making. Uh, the, in my judgment, uh, we're at the, what, um, eight and a half year mark, roughly. Uh, that war is not over. Uh, uh, the lines have been straightened a bit, um, but there are any number of unresolved issues. Uh, territorially, the northwest Idlib uh, is now home to um, uh, everyone who still has a gun in his hand. Um, directed against uh, Syria and its Iranian and Russian allies. 
Uh, so it's a pause for um, uh, reassessing, realigning, regrouping. Uh, it will enter some new phase. I, I don't know what it is, but this, this war is not over. Um, what are you going to get in the meantime? Well, things like, as we've seen, uh, President deciding that he wants all of our forces out um, uh, the day before yesterday, uh, which gave the Turks all they needed to move several divisions into Kurdish-held areas. Uh, this will tend to be highly volatile. It will uh, continue to harbor the dangers of a much broader conflagration, where we, which we almost got. Uh, downing two years ago of an Israeli F-16 had not happened in 15 years. Mercifully, the pilots survived it and uh, parachuted into Israeli territory. Had they been killed or captured uh, in, in Syria, uh, we might have gone to a full regional war right there. Uh, similarly, with the uh, killings of any number of little green Russian men, um, uh, that could have led somewhere very nasty. Um, right now, none of the principal protagonists want a broader war. Uh, but lest you find that a comfort, nobody wanted World War I either. Right. So do you think it ends with Syria as a nation state that it looks like now, or is it a Kurdish area, a Turkish area, an Iranian area, and maybe a little bit of Syria? Well, a lot of uh, Syria, like a lot of the Middle East, is um, uh, it, it's sand. Um, so the maps, in that sense, can be uh, deceiving. I like to use a population-based map for any kind of detailed conversation. Um, that is a possible scenario, uh, in which case uh, the war is going to go on for a very long time, because there will be uh, a constant contest of who's going to hold how much of what. Right. Uh, one thing I can predict with some confidence, uh, you, you're not going to see a Kurdish mini-state. Um, uh, Simply because the Turks won't allow the, it? Tur Here's the thing. Uh, one of the world's hard truths is that there are more nationalisms than nations. Um, the Kurds have the misfortune to be spread among four states, principally Turkey, Syria, Iran, and Iraq, four countries that agree on absolutely nothing except that there should never be an independent Kurdish state. So. Um, so should the Kurds run the flag up the pole, um, I can guarantee you that it will come down um, pretty darn soon, uh, brought to you by the Turkish Second Army. And so I actually don't even know why they all hate the Kurds. Um, that's why I would have said the same thing about an Israeli state in 1948, but so maybe there's hope for the Kurds after all. But so what, I, I don't even know what Kurds are, to tell you the truth. Ah. Uh, and uh, yes, well, the question of identities in the Middle East is a fascinating one. Uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, the Kurds have um, claimed to a unique ethnic uh, ethnicity that is uh, not Semitic, uh, Aryan, uh, but so, so are Persians, also Aryan, but Kurds are not Persians and vice versa. Uh, so really the identity uh, is is kind of whatever they want it to be. Uh, but, but it is interesting in a region increasingly defined in sectarian terms, um, uh, the Kurds, most of whom are, the vast majority of whom are Sunni Muslims, um, uh, do not see that as part of their identity. They, they, uh, they cling to their ethnicity, um, uh, making common cause with other minorities. So in Syria, for example, uh, the Alawis, which that is a sectarian identity, not an ethnic one, but Alawis and Kurds have gotten along pretty well. Um, indeed, the, we've seen the news of the outreach by the Kurds after the Turkish offensive to the uh, Damascus regime. I was ambassador there for three years. Uh, everybody had trouble with the Assad regime except the Kurds. Minority and minority facing a potentially very dangerous majority of Sunni Arabs. Uh, so the sands will shift, the um, alliances will wax and wane, uh, but the constant here again is that unless they all um, coalesce into one geographic region, uh, which isn't going to happen, uh, you will not see an independent Kurdish state emerge. 
Okay. Well, maybe we should move on then to Turkey. Um, it's funny you were talking about Kemal Ataturk because I remember going there 30 years ago and in every shop there was a picture of Ataturk, um, almost like you'd see in Boston a picture of JFK a generation ago. Um, and there was a cult of Ataturk and there was a belief that if the, if the religious folks went too far, the army, which formerly was headed by Ataturk, would throw them out and fix things. And I think now Erdogan has basically purged the army of the Ataturk folks. Um, so where is, where is Turkey going? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so Turkey was not a founding member of NATO. I think it joined four years after the creation. Uh, but a, a critical element in Soviet containment and European stability. Uh, uh, the Turks uh, harbor by far the largest number of Syrian refugees, over three million. Um, and uh, they exacted a high price, but the Turkish uh, decision to halt the refugee flow into Europe um, probably spared Europe major, major instability. Um, well, I mean, when you say harbor, harbor sounds very benign. Or, are they in a harbor or are they in cages? Uh, no. Uh, in, um, in Jordan, they're in camps, largely. In Lebanon, they're not because of the experience with the Palestinian camps. In Turkey, by and large, they are not. They're, they're uh, integrated at varying levels of completeness in Turkey society. Um, and it, it's caused some frictions, certainly, because the economy is not doing brilliantly. But, but by and large, uh, you do not see or hear uh, stories of uh, uh, abuse of the, <clears throat> the Syrian population uh, in Turkey. Interesting. Some good news at last. So the thing here is, just to finish on this, because it is important, um, as we all decide that Turkey is no friend or ally any longer, uh, this is something the West created. For years, Europe found a way to subtly or less subtly tell the Turks that you're good enough to join NATO and fight and die for the rest of us in Europe, but you're never going to be good enough to join the Gentlemen's Club of the European Union. Uh, Turks are a proud people. Erdogan sensed an opportunity uh, to appeal to the lower, uh, mainly rural, agricultural base of the country uh, who had felt they had had their noses rubbed into their non europeanness uh, more than adequately and uh, have rallied to his appeal uh, to make Turkey great again, as in Ottoman Empire. Right. Uh, uh, so what, what we're dealing with, uh, we by and large did not. We had urged the Europeans to support EU ascendancy for precisely some of the same reasons we're looking at now. Uh, they didn't, uh, so Erdogan just took advantage of it. So in the Middle East, though, I mean, who are their sort of natural enemies in the wild? I mean, do they hate Iran more, or Saudi Arabia more? I think I read they were the only sort of friend of the Muslim Brotherhood, even when everyone else was denouncing them as a terrorist organization. Very good point. Uh, the, uh, yes, they are in a, a, a state of um, enmity, maybe too strong a word, but the relationship with Saudi Arabia is not good, which is why the Turks played up the uh, Jamal Khashoggi murder as, mm -hmm. to the extent they did. Uh, Erdogan is considered by the Saudis to be a Muslim brother. Uh, and for Saudi Arabia, uh, the Muslim brothers are the enemy. Uh, we seem to be taking that line too, which is as dangerous as it is dumb. Uh, Muslim brothers come in all kinds of flavors. Mm -hmm. uh, in places like Iraq and Jordan, uh, they are the, the only legitimate, if you will, Sunni political organization. If you're going to uh, label them a terrorist organization, you're not going to have anything, anyone to talk to in right. countries like that. So yes, uh, it's that uh, Muslim brother affiliation that drives the Saudis crazy. Okay, so you mentioned Saudi Arabia. We'll go there next. So I mean, um, President Trump obviously has been roundly criticized for continuing to ally with Mohammed bin Salman after the Khashoggi murder. Um, although I would note that FDR allied with Stalin after he murdered 20 million people. Um, and actually had the delightful quote, which may be apt, that with the death of one person is a tragedy, the death of a million people is a statistic. Um, so w what choice do we have? I mean, we can't really change sides and say we're now for Iran, not Saudi Arabia. 
So a tragic death aside, or murder actually, a violent tragic murder aside, what options are there? Uh, it, it's a great question. Um, so I talked about bad choices and worse choices. Um, uh, among the many luxuries we do not have in the Middle East is a choice between democracies and autocracies because, again, as I mentioned, only fully-fledged democracy in the country and the region is, is Israel. Um, the way I frame it is to say we've got the choice between order and disorder a, as we uh, define it. Forces of order have been our traditional partners in the region. Uh, that would be Saudi Arabia and its Gulf state neighbors. Uh, it would be Israel. It would be Jordan. It would be Egypt. It would be Turkey. Um, our relations with all of those countries had kind of slid off the edge during the Obama years. Um, uh, he referred to them again publicly as so-called allies. Um, do we have problems with all of them? Yes, we certainly do. But we don't have any other good choices. Um, the forces of disorder in the current context would be um, Iran and its uh, non-state affiliates, uh, uh, starting with, but by no means ending with, Hezbollah, and then running through a variety of uh, uh, militia elements they've created in the area. So as a, I consider myself to be, after all those years in the Middle East, to be reasonably practically minded, uh, don't, don't give up your traditional allies because they do distasteful things unless you know where you're going to land next. Um, uh, Iran would like nothing better than to see us turn against uh, the Saudis and uh, uh, our other traditional allies. Well, and sort of related to Saudi Arabia, I mean, how stable now is Saudi Arabia? I see 70% of the population is under 30. Unlike the Chinese, they have access to social media. There were reports actually in the Wall Street Journal this weekend about you know, even as there's political repression, there's been an extraordinary campaign of social liberalization, you know, women driving, but also parties and tourism. And I mean, is, is that something they can, they can pull off um, and still maintain the kingdom they have? Uh, <clears throat> again, this touches on a, an issue that I think is really important and uh, we do not handle terribly well. Um, uh, Saudi Arabia is the most is the second most opaque political culture in the region. Iran is the most complex. Uh, we we don't know how the House of Saud works. Uh, we don't know how they make their decisions, uh, uh, and that's the way they want it. Uh, that is a closed book to us. One of the most critical f qualities to have in uh, if you're in the national security and foreign policy space in this country is to know the limits of your knowledge. Uh, I apologize. This is actually my son calling to tell me that he got engaged, I believe. But he can wait for five minutes. Or, or that she said no, which would be a total freaking disaster. Um, all right. I'll call him back in a minute. <laughs> On to Tunisia. Yeah. Sorry. Where were you? Uh, uh, our limitless ignorance <laughs> of most things Saudi. Yes. Uh, uh, we don't know how they make their decisions. And if, if we pretend we do, uh, we're going to make things even worse. Uh, I will tell you, of course, uh, uh, people have gotten rich for decades now predicting the imminent demise of the, um, the, the Saudi royal family. It goes back to the mid-70s, Arabia without sultans was the title of one book. Um, yet, as you, uh, Saudi Arabia has weathered the Arab Spring um, with remarkably little turbulence, uh, as have really all the monarchies in the region. Um, and not all the monarchies have oil. Morocco does not have oil. Jordan does not have oil. They are monarchies, and they have maintained their stability uh, when the so-called republics have gone down. And I, no one would have predicted that at the beginning, and I, I just toss it out to you as an example of all that we do not know. Um, we do not know how the Saudis maintain their stability. It's not just money. Uh, so just, you know, you need to be very careful about predicting what's going to happen next in Saudi Arabia. Um, uh, MBS, Mohammed bin Salman, is a new, a new kind of Saudi leader. 
we, we haven't seen that before. Uh, it doesn't mean that he is going to revolutionize the country or that he is going to be the one who inadvertently topples the monarchy. Um, uh, and I, I would say my, my f friends on the left hate it, but uh, uh, I, I think the president did the right thing by not pulling the plug on a relationship over Khashoggi. Um, at the same time, we have not seen the president use the uh, capital he has presumably built up in the kingdom uh, for a serious discussion on um, internal affairs and regional projection of power. Right. Um, again, uh, this administration could be doing a lot more positive things that it has inadvertently, in some cases, prepped the battlefield for, Saudi Arabia being one, but they don't have the follow through. So just on, on the economic side, because we think about economics here, I mean, is there any, I think I know the answer to this question, uh, is there any hope for greater regional economic collaboration? Somebody was asking about whether there could be an Arab currency. I know the Arab League has, in theory, been designed to promote something like the EU. Uh, this doesn't sound like it's going anywhere good, though, does it? Uh, no, it doesn't. And we've long been in favor of more interregional trade. Uh, it, it just isn't there. Uh, uh, in part, that is because of simply the structure of uh, their economies. But again, it falls back on that broader question of governance. Um, uh, if you have political instability in a country and regionally, uh, if you have governments whose imperative has never really been economic development, it's been survival, political mm -hmm. survival, awfully, awfully hard to do the hard analysis and the hard work to build up some commonalities. And we certainly see that in the economic sphere, also in the security sphere. Um, uh, there, there just isn't going to be a, uh, an Arab NATO, for example. Right. Uh, the, the differences uh, among them are, are too great to, to permit that. Uh, <clears throat> they would all be interested in how they could use such a force to further their own gains <laughs> at the expense of their neighbors before their neighbors do it to them. Right. So maybe a related question, since we're finance people here, if, you know, considering sort of where all these countries are sort of trading now in sort of economic political terms, if you look at it, say you get a 10-year option and you could be long one and short one, who would you be long and who would you be short? Oh. Well, first, I have to tell you that my idea of an extreme long-range prediction in the Middle East would be a week from Thursday. <laughs> um, uh, <clears throat> well, we, we're, I would ac uh, accept Israel from this. I mean, yeah, they, right. they are there for you right. know, the long, long term if they can ever form a government. Uh, <clears throat> uh, for the rest, um, uh, Again, I, I, I spoke of the monarchies. I think that is worth some study, that uh, uh, in a place like Morocco, for example, you may have more freedom of political discourse uh, than most other places in the region, and that may have worked for them. Um, Tunisia has been the one Arab Spring country that looks like it's got a shot at a sustainable uh, democratic state. Doesn't tell you much about others because the scale is small. Well, I also saw that they have, I think, 30% unemployment, which yeah. shows how bad you can be and still be at the top. Yeah, and of course, we've always held up those kinds of numbers, high unemployment, uh, the vast majority of ex-population under the age of 30 and so forth. Uh, that has never produced the instability that we actually thought it would. And I, I would just go back to um, what I said earlier, to, to, to try to pretend that we know what the dynamics of stability and instability are in a given country, uh, very hard to do. Uh, Lebanon, in which I spent six fun-filled years on two tours, you know, I kept putting my hand up anywhere but Washington, um, and they, they found me everywhere but Washington. <laughs> Wasn't a bad deal. Uh, a lot of folks, including me, thought it would reignite the Lebanese Civil War, because um, those fissures are still there and quite deep. So far it hasn't. And in its own uniquely Lebanese way, they're kind of uh, uh, continuing managed chaos uh, uh, may see them through all of this. So, so three more and then I promise to stop. Um, my son who's calling uh, is actually a sports writer and I think one of the central tenets of sports writing is that there's 
no clapping in the press box, that you don't root. But you know, you've, you know, bring back map, you know, you've ambassadored in all of these places. Do you root for one people versus another? Um, are there, who's your favorite? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well. Um, who's like the Carolina versus the Duke of your suit? You know, actually, uh, real football, soccer, is, uh, is a blood sport out there. I, you see it in places like Egypt. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not ducking it uh, exactly. Um, I, I, you are a diplomat after all, so maybe yeah, we're well, going to see you in action. Um, you know, I'm sometimes asked which post I enjoyed the most. Well, enjoyment doesn't really translate to, you know, a Beirut or a Baghdad or a Kabul. Um, I, I have found, though, those uh, war zone assignments to be the, uh, the most rewarding uh, uh, experiences that you just don't get normally. Um, uh, so there, there's none of them that I wish I hadn't done. Um, um, but was there, was there a, see, I won't let you duck. Was there a people that, you know, if you go around the United States, sometimes you like the Texans, sometimes you like the Californians. Have, have you spent any time in Texas? <laughs> I was, Comerica is a member, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so do you, was there a people you felt most comfortable with and what? Well, if you feel comfortable with any of them, you probably need counseling. Yeah. Uh, um, um, well, look, the Lebanese are amazing. Um, you know, they, they, many of them live the good life and live the good life through the worst. You know, I'll call you up and say, hey, let's go to the Orangerie for dinner tonight. Um, there's fighting just a block away, so it's going to be easy to get a table. Um, um, and yeah, they do. Um, I, were, were you there in Beirut in the good old days? Because I've always heard that was just a magical place. Or did you only see the bad days? Yeah, so I was uh, in Qatar somewhere out there and um, managed to wangle a weekend in Beirut. This would have been um, 73, 74, just before the Civil War. Thought I'd go up and have a drink at the Phoenicia Hotel. They had a rooftop bar, that breathtaking view of the Mediterranean and so forth. Uh, I wasn't allowed in because I wasn't wearing a tie. Um, uh, so um, about a year and a half later, when the Phoenicia uh, became the front line uh, with uh, fighters from both sides in the hotel murdering each other, I thought they got exactly what they deserved. It was, a, <laughs> it, it, it was highly satisfying. Yeah. Yes, I was there in the good old days. So. Yeah. OK, two, two more. Um, someone was asking about, and you know, it's, well, I guess technically it is part of the Middle East, but I mean, as I don't know, there's anyone who knows more about Afghanistan than you do. Um, what what is the prospect there? Yeah, so the hundred year thing again. Uh, uh, 2019, in fact, November 2019 is for the Afghans their hundredth anniversary of the uh, founding of the modern Afghan state under uh, a leader called Amanullah Khan in 1919. Uh, that was after the third Afghan-British War of 1919. The Brits fought three wars, lost them all. Um, 1919 was more of a skirmish. Um, during that hundred-year stretch, the Afghan state had to have foreign assistance throughout uh, to, to really be even close to viable. Um, uh, as I look at Afghanistan now with all of the, uh, the horror and the bad headlines and so forth, uh, I look at our force presence, which is dipped below 10,000. When I was there, when I left in 2012, it was 100,000. Um, so we've gone down to one-tenth, and the state is still holding on. Uh, the Taliban, there are 34 provinces in Afghanistan. Uh, the Taliban hold zero provincial capitals. Um, they control a lot of sand, and you, know, you see these fake news reports of uh, the Taliban control 53% of the country. Well, you know, about 82% of their 53% uh, is uninhabitable. So, so what, what we're seeing is that in spite of horrific losses, Afghan security forces continue to be in the fight. Um, uh, as long as we maintain a credible force there, they will stay in the fight. 
It's, it's now, I think, more symbolic of our presence uh, than it is actual, because we're not doing frontline fighting anymore. Uh, so I hope very much that uh, the president drives a spike through these awful negotiations that are being run by Zal Khalil Zad, which frankly are the Paris peace talks all over again. You know, we, when we sat down at the table, we were telling the VC and the North Vietnamese, we're done, you win, we lose, let's put some lipstick on this, give us a decent interval, and then you can take over. Well, that's where these Taliban talks will lead if we're dumb enough to pursue them again. If we maintain more or less where we are, uh, uh, I, I think the government will maintain its admittedly tenuous hold, and we will have a, um, a pretty inexpensive insurance policy against uh, another 9-11. Excellent. So, last hard question. So, let's go back to 1978. You know, Egypt, Israel make peace. Suez Canal is now guaranteed open. If the U.S. had entirely exited the Middle East, no diplomacy, no military, no nothing, would the map look any different now? Yeah, but I couldn't tell you how. Uh, there would have been no um, Egyptian-Israeli peace. Uh, let alone a Jordanian-Israeli peace. Um, Kuwait would have been occupied by Iraq. Uh, Iraqi claims to Kuwait go back to the 1930s. Uh, uh, they would probably have pushed on into Saudi Arabia, and the Saudis wouldn't have been able to stop them. Um, and would that have been a good thing or a bad thing? Well, you have a, a certified megalomaniac running Iraq at the time. Uh, uh, probably not a good thing. Um, hard, hard to say. but. Uh, uh, so often in the Middle East, it's the, the, it's the worst two are the strongest. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and again, I, I, we take it for granted now. We shouldn't. The, that Egyptian-Israeli peace was something that Kissinger referred to. Um, um, there will be no war without Egypt, no peace without Syria. Uh, he was certainly right on the first one. Um, uh, I, I had the chance to see uh, the current Syrian uh, Egyptian president, uh, Abdel Fattah Sisi, a couple of times, first meeting with him uh, uh, before the 2016 election. Um, he kept me waiting. He, then he bounds into the room, grabs my hand with both of his, and says, I want to thank you. And this was at a time when he wasn't thanking us for much of anything. Um, and I said, for what, sir? said, for the Egyptian-Israeli peace, um, we never could have done it without America. And now it is the bedrock of our national security. So my, my problem is that I now have a better relationship with the Prime Minister of Israel than with the President of the United States. Um, that would not have happened without us. Um, and if Kissinger was right, no war without Egypt. Had that peace not transpired, God knows where the region would have gone would have gone nowhere good. Uh, we tend to beat up on ourselves, um, uh, and maybe that's healthy, but uh, I, I can tell you with, with great conviction that the map of the Middle East would be a whole lot bloodier now, and maybe regions beyond the Middle East, had we not played that internationalist role there so consistently. Did we do the right thing all the time? Of course we didn't. Uh, but it's as King Hussein said, uh, sorry, King Abdullah said of Jordan publicly in the latter years of the Obama administration that he found it ironic that he had more confidence um, of the goodness of the United States in the Middle East than the United States had of itself. And I think that is very true. We, we look at the bad, uh, but boy, had we not been out there, uh, it, it could and I think would have been a whole lot worse. That sounds like a great note to end on. I can't thank you enough. This has been so much fun. So, thank you. And I, again, I'll try to find one last thing to say to uh, uh, give you some hope. As bad as we've described things now, um, and they are pretty bad out there, in six months you'll be looking back at this event and our conversation um, uh, with um, real nostalgia. <laughs> because six months from now, it's going to be way worse. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.